for joining us for Historic Annapolis' very first Facebook Live event. We're, the year, we're here on Pinckney Street. It's 1770, and a lot of things are going up by the dock, and a lot of things are going up with the merchants up Pinckney Street. We're going to be visiting three sites, the Waterfront Warehouse, the Shiplap House, and Hogshead, where we're going to find Mrs. Cackle, who's a milliner. She's going to be telling you about how women add to the mercantile site in Colonial Annapolis. Thank you again for joining us, and I'm going to introduce you to William Eggman, the stationer, who's with us today. William, well, yeah. welcome to Annapolis. I'll be your host for today. I'm William Eggman. I own a stationer shop here in Annapolis. There's been a lot going on of late. You might have heard a few years ago, Parliament passed the Townsend Act, which taxed glass, paper, tea, and paint. And Parliament would pass these acts without asking the colonists, uh, who don't have any representation in Parliament anyway, if they could be taxed. Uh, now, the Parliament had some very good reasons, you might say, for taxing us. There's something called the Seven Years' War. This is raising money for paying for those expenses. But still, this point stands that the colonists do not uh, have any representation in Parliament, and they're very upset about the taxation. So they came together and they formed non importation associations where the merchants of a particular colony would agree to boycott British goods. And this uh, was all well and good for political purposes, but for the actual merchants who were affected, this is very hard on their business. And I'm going to introduce you to one of these merchants right now, Anthony Stewart, who has a lot to say on the matter. Good evening. Uh, actually on my way to the docks right now to meet a ship captain from Rhode Island. Um, as Mr. Aikman has talked about, the association decided in 1769 to go into a non-importation agreement. I myself was not a signatory on the association's documents, but my father-in-law and business partner, James Dick, was a signer of that agreement. Um, the reason I'm meeting this captain right now from Rhode Island is because the province of Rhode Island, the colony has decided to end the embargo. Uh, now that multiple of the acts and taxes have been repealed, with the exception of the Indemnity Act, which still taxes tea, the colony of Rhode Island has decided that they should end the embargo, which I'm hoping that the colony of Maryland will do soon as well. Uh, you, may why, you may ask why would Rhode Island end it, but Maryland is not. It's, it's a simple matter of do we want to continue with this embargo, hurting ourselves, hurting the merchants, the vendors, the shopkeepers of this colony, or do we want to simply hope for a Pyrrhic victory uh, to end the taxation on tea, something that we as merchants don't even import into this country. So I'm hoping that he can shed some light on what's going on in Rhode Island to, to see why they've ended their embargo when we in Maryland have it. It's not that they haven't been trying. Only last week in Prince George's County, they took a vote uh, to end the embargo and they voted um, in favor of keeping the embargo going until the tax on tea would be ended. I'm, I myself in this warehouse here holding, it's very bare at this moment, as we've been in the embargo for many months and have yet to get anything in. Uh, you may recall in February of last, of earlier this year, uh, the incident of the good intent going in, which I will say, although my reputation may be besmeared, uh, we were in complete compliance with the association and their embargo. You see, it's all a misunderstanding if you've never heard. So the good intent was laden with goods that we had ordered in 1768, well before the embargo was even thought of, much less before it had been passed. And when the goods came in, our trade partner in London, John Buchanan and son, numerous times asked us if they'd like us to ship the goods, but in the spirit of the embargo and of the act, we told Buchanan on numerous occasions to keep those goods in England until such time that they could be sent over. Well, against our will and against the wishes of myself and my father-in-law, James Dick, uh, Samuel Buchanan, his son, and one of, our, one of the other merchants in Annapolis, sent a letter to John Buchanan and stated that if the goods were brought over to the colonies, that the colonists would have no problems. As you recall in February, that was not the case. And as soon as the ship arrived in port, we did not disembark the cargo. We did not pay any taxes on them. We kept the goods in tow until they could be until the association could take heed. And despite the fact that it did much financial harm to our business um, and potentially to the captain of the good intent who his ship had already been contracted to head back to London after it arrived in Maryland, we shipped all of those goods back. Uh, it's been a long time, the taxes are done, the, the repeals have gone through, it's time to open the economy back up again. Thank you so much, Mr. Stewart. Do we have 
you have any questions coming in from the uh, from our viewers abroad? Have you paid your taxes, Mr. Stewart? Actually, we've paid all of our taxes. In fact, uh, in the late of 1769, there was a ship that came into port. Uh, wasn't one of my ships, wasn't a, a goods that belonged to us. Uh, but as it had been sent over before the news of the trade embargo, which by the way, our contacts in London were in full support of, and the unfair treatment of the colonies, they stood fast with us. But when a ship came in that had disembarked from London before news of the embargo to Maryland could have been made public to them, it arrived in this port. When it did so, we decided to purchase all of those goods and be held in our warehouse until such a time that they could legally be sold. So yes, we paid the taxes on them, but in the spirit of the embargo, we have done nothing with those goods until they can be legally sold within the confines of the embargo that was signed. Thank you for being a good subject, sir. Okay. I'm walking up the street. I see a, young, a gentleman of my acquaintance, John Flack, an infamous sailor. Good evening, John. How are you? Oh, well, you know, I've been uh, staring down the street here looking at the dock all day waiting for a ship to come in. Just like I had for the last week. The, uh, the, the job situation for sailors these days is just not good. It's this non-importation association. No trade means no ships, and no ships means no jobs for sailors. Forced to find whatever I can get. You end up with situations like you had in Boston a few months ago. You heard about the, the massacre in Boston, right? Everybody's heard of it by now. But uh, many of those, many of those men shot were sailors, and uh, they were they were just trying to find jobs. And you know who was else competing was competing for those jobs? Those soldiers. I think King George needs to pay his soldiers a little better. This kind of thing wouldn't happen. Or maybe, or maybe this association needs to end, and I can get back to work. I don't care much about taxes. I just I just want to make a living. I'd take just about anything right now. Almost anything. I mean, I I worked a slave ship last year and I'd never work one of those again. Uh, two months on board that ship from Africa to, to Annapolis. Those poor people packed into that hold, crowded together, chained, unable to move for days. I, it was hard. I, I shouldn't, I can't even think about it. I need to stop thinking about that. I just, it doesn't look like anything's coming anyway. So I guess I'm just going to head back to my lodgings. Maybe I'll see what Mr. Gibbons has on the menu up the street. How long have you been at sea? Uh, my last trip, I spent uh, three months. I, I took the ship over to uh, Bristol uh, and then back here to Annapolis. Uh, That's a long time away from family. Well, uh, my family is in Philadelphia. I haven't seen them in years. Uh, you know, I just go where the jobs are. This is the life of a sailor. You, you know, you're in one port for, for a year and then you know, next thing you know, you're in another one, another one. And Michelle would like to know, um, Sailor, what's your favorite port of call? And how are you coping on land? Uh, I think I think my favorite my favorite has, has got to be Brest in France. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful city and just fun when I'm when I'm on on leave. Just a lot of things to do. Uh, I usually like to be on land for, for a short period of time. I've been on land for about a month now, and I'm starting to get um, antsy to get back to sea. Plus, I'm running out of money. When you were in Boston, why was the crowd so angry? People are asking. Well, the uh, the soldiers uh, were there to enforce the taxes to protect the, the customs house, but the soldiers are also hanging around the community. They're they're, like I said, trying to get jobs in their in their off hours because they don't get paid enough, apparently. Accosting the women of the town. 
that too. Um, and just generally, they act like they own the place. Um, and you end up, they, they, they buy things on credit, and don't pay off their bills. Particularly the officers of the 29. That was the complaint I understand. Well, I never encountered any of the officers, but some of the, uh, the privates I had, and uh, believe me, uh, they were not people I want to associate with. But I don't know if you've seen Mr. Revere's engraving here showing the incident. This came in of late. Demonstrating what happened, soldiers firing into a crowd. The most shocking sight for any British subject to see. Shame. Uh, it turns my stomach, but I see up here. What do you have for dinner, sir? Boy, you look absolutely famished. Well, come on closer. I have something here for any appetite. As you can see, I've got here pasties. I have behind me as well small, good, excellent small cakes, Shrewsbury cakes, and gingerbread. Now, if a pasty suits your need, inside of these wonderful pasties, you'll find excellent fine pork, freshly butchered here in Annapolis. Also, I picked up some onions and some potatoes, recently purchased from London Town. And I even managed to pick up some apples from Connecticut back when they were first harvested. Now, mind you, they're still just as crisp as when they were first plucked from the tree. So all of those are in these beautiful pasties here. Maybe one of these excellent small cakes will suit your desire. Here we have inside these, we have currants, and it's even topped with a wonderful frosting. Perhaps something a little bit lighter with a lemony twist. In the middle, we have those Shrewsbury cakes. Or on the far right, this is a popular one back uh, in England. Here we have gingerbreads. And of course, they have molasses, and uh, as well as, of course, that ginger and other spices such as nutmeg and cloves. Now, those last couple are hard to come by. This is non importation agreement. I hear there might be settling something, but regardless, I'm here to sell you some food, not to uh, perhaps like you would find in a tavern, fill your, uh, fill your bone box with the philosophy of a pumpkin gentleman. Now, here, I will sell you an honest, uh, an honest piece of food and send you on your way. Is there something I can help you with? The Shrewsbury. The Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury yeah. cakes. How, how much are they, sir? Well, you can have, you look like an honest one. I'll, I'll you. sell you four for a penny. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it for you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I'll be coming back here, sir. Let me get one of those cats. laundry that I've done for various customers here in Annapolis. Um, you see, living here in Annapolis, such in a city such as this, if you did have the means, many people send their laundry up to someone like me to get it done, um, sort of like how people nowadays, um, for you, may be um, sending up to a dry cleaner. Now, the laundry that I mainly specify in is your undergarments, such as your shifts or your shirts, which require um, a lot more like heavy duty care to them because those are the garments that are closest to your body. So are so soaking up the sweat and the oil and the dirt so they don't get on your fine outer, outer clothes. Like you may see some people here wearing either wool or a fine linen or cotton or maybe even silk. So um, laundry is a pretty heavy duty process. You um, need live soap, which can be very hard on the hands, and even the clothes if you don't know how to use it properly. Then you have to iron um, if you do want your things ironed, like some of the top ones that I have here in my basket. And that requires a um, solid metal iron that you heat over a bed of coals or a stove. And then that takes a fair amount of practice because you don't want to burn through the, clo the cloth, of course. Now, you may also be wondering, because everybody is sort of wearing the same basic white undergarment, a shift for women or a shirt for men, if everybody has the same thing, then how can I tell whose who's it is supposed to go to since I'm supposed to be delivering it? Well, everybody has something called a laundry mark on their clothes, and it may either be at the collar or the neckline of your shift or your shirt or along the um, shirt cuff of your shift to your shirt. 
And that can be either a symbol that you've embroidered or your initials that you've cross-stitched into it. And then perhaps if you have multiples of those garments, you will um, have the number that it is so that you can keep track of all of your clothes. And that way also, if something were to accidentally be delivered to someone else, then I could realize, oh, someone else has it and then pick it up and deliver it to the right person. It was so lovely to see you today. Do we have any questions? We do. Oh, we do. We do. Sorry. Do you do your own laundry separate? Do you do everybody else's? How do you how do you get your clients? My clients are mostly by word of mouth. So going around or perhaps if I really wanted to, and I was low, I could place an advertisement in a newspaper such as the Maryland Gazette. Um, and going around and perhaps if um, one person really enjoyed my services, they may recommend me to a friend. And then that way, um, then also I think going off of the how do I do the clothes, everything gets dumped in one um, big um, that. Is it that. Big? Yes, it's a, um, a big wash tub. Yes, a big wash tub. I'm sorry, I forgot my that's words. Nice. Um, and so that's also why that laundry mark is so important. Um, so that because I'm doing it all and it's just, I could be pulling out one person's clothing, then I could be doing the next person's, but then that other person's originally again. And um, it's easier to help not get it mixed up. We have one other question for you. Let's see. Somebody wants to know, how, how much did you earn doing laundry? Could you make how a much? living by it? Well, yes, obviously. This laundry is the only thing that I do. Um, now, other people actually, a common um, source of income specifically for women with families actually would be to hire out their services to do laundry. So um, doing a shirt, um, two shirts or shifts is roughly one shilling. Um, and to put it sort of in perspective, roughly an average farm laborers, um, day to two day wages depending on what it is is two shillings so that's quite good mm -hmm. that's quite good we have one more question from michelle and michelle is wondering what's the best way to get ale stains out of your shirts ale stains out of your shirts absolutely so there's various different things that you can do one thing that i know off the top of my head if it's a protein you want to put salt and use cold water um so a lot of it is soaked in water I actually don't use hot water right away. Like if you think of a modern washing machine, you may think of like, oh, your hot water goes first. But most of the clothing is actually first done in cold water with soap and then beaten out. And that's how you really get a lot of the state. So I'm not really doing a lot of scrubbing with soap because like I said, my soap is lye soap and lye soap is quite hard on the fibers and actually over time will deteriorate the um, strength of them, which is also really important why we all wear our shifts and our shirts underneath it, because that fabric is considerably cheaper than a cotton or a silk or a wool. And it's very easy to make a new shift. It may be harder to make a new gown or a, or a coat. One little last question, how much can you do in a day? How much laundry or how many how days much, does it take to do it? How much? It takes me roughly three days to do laundry, just because one day you sort of need to um, get it all together, soak it, wash it, dry it. I like to dry it for roughly a day to a half a day, depending on what the sun is outside. And then you also have to do the ironing and the delivery. And sometimes if I'm lucky, I can do my delivery and my pickup at the same time. Thank you, Mistress Elizabeth. Of course. So happy to have run into you. Well, we had a question from earlier for Mr. Stewart here. Mr. Stewart, sir. How is the embargo being enforced? I'm going to say, Mr. Aikman, first of all, you've not gone far. You've been all around this town, and you're still on the same street. Some of us have shorter legs. Very well. Uh, the embargo <laughs> is being enforced. There's no, no sort of sheriff or anything that's, that's enforcing it because it's an agreement between gentlemen. The embargo is being forced via publicity. Uh, most simply, everything is being published in the Maryland Gazette. We know exactly what's going on. Every single time a ship arrives in the harbor, People know that it's going to be there. Someone knows what's on that ship. They're going, if it's something that's not supposed to be on that ship, someone's going to, going to know about it. They're going to tell uh, the publisher of the Maryland Gazette and they're going to publish it in the paper. So everyone's going to know that 
James, that Anthony Stewart, James Dick and Company, any other merchant in this town is violating the embargo. It's going to be published in, in the Gazette and everyone's going to know about it. Uh, if it becomes even more of, a, of an event that something should happen, that there are embargoed goods and people are doing what they're not supposed to be doing, you may go another step further and a pamphlet will be published. Uh, there was a pamphlet outlining all of the proceedings of when the good intent arrived in port in February that was published after the Maryland Gazette articles came out regarding it. Uh, you can read it. I believe the state has free copies of it that they're distributing if you know where to get them. So the only question we have, Mr. Uh, I believe that is the only question that we have right now. Thank you so much, Mr. Stewart. Very good. Enjoy your evening walk. Good day, Miss Rockle. I have I'm some, some respite out here from the It is an uncommon hot day. We have some visitors for you. Oh, won't you please come in the show? Please introduce yourself. I am Catherine Rappel. I have the millinery shop here with my partner, Miss Jane Nelson. We also have a servant that deals with the housekeeping while we work, and we have an apprentice. So we are truly a business that is run and owned by women. Won't you come in and see what we do have for sale? We do not have a lot left. You may remember that last September in 1769, I arrived here from London with an entire shops full of merchandise. We left London before we received word of the embargo, so we were able to sell all of those goods which are now included in the embargo. But we are running quite low on those items, and we are trying to figure out how to keep our business going, because as the finery sells out, we cannot replenish. So we have a choice of either going back to London and staying there a few months and coming back when the economy is open, or we can choose to import the goods that are allowed, which are sadly not what our ladies and gentlemen of quality here in Annapolis are looking for. They are the lower cost textiles. They are narrow cloths that really are not suitable for gowns and very plain fabrics. So we right now carry luxurious items and ornaments that ladies and gentlemen would like to wear. We have some Toilette items for the lady of quality. We have hairpins, we have combs, we have powder, we have bows, breast knots, anything that she would like to decorate her hair. We have mitts of leather and of linen and silk, and we have stockings, fans, muffs, but sadly, this is all we have left. We do have some finer cloths, some silk, some velvet, some worsted stuff. We have just a tiny bit of mourning left. All mourning items are included on the embargo, so this is all we have left and we are not able to obtain more. We are trying to earn more money by providing some services. For example, Miss Bryce sent down an order. She asked us to cover her umbrella sticks, to make her a stomacher, a breast knot, and dress a doll. So those require small bits of cloth, and we are able to stretch it by making smaller items. We also are having ladies order their hats decorated instead of decorating them first. That way we know that we will sell a decorated hat and not have used cloth just for it to sit and not be sold. Uh, you can see my partner was starting to trim a hat right there before she went home for the evening, and I stayed to finish this umbrella. So we are kept quite busy, and we are still working on making this economy work for us. We have a few questions for you. Yes. Somebody would like to know what uh, worsted means. Worsted is what you would call wool. It is a smooth wool and a hard wool. It is used for ladies' gowns. It is used for gentlemen's attire. Very nice. And do you plan to buy homespun textiles? Yes, we do. We have found a few spinners and a few weavers near Annapolis, and we would like to carry some homespun. We, we need some way to sell and make money, so 
We will do what the market asks us to do. Wonderful. And uh, Phil Boss wants to know what goes into making hair powder. Hair powder. How do you carry it? Well, some has crushed bone, mm -hmm. some has wheat flour, it has scents such as cloves or lavender. It also has lard that we must boil and make sure it is clean because it has to moisturize. Oh no, that, sorry, that is the pomatum, has the mm. lard. But the powder is scents and white powder, which Very is nice. usually wheat powder. Thank you. Somebody is also admiring some of your uh, wares over here. The muff, I believe, and yes. little things. Can you share us some of those? This is a silk cover oh. muff. It is filled with down. Mistress, did you make that? Yes, indeed. And we have a local painter that paints the silk for us if we would like so pictures. So it's a, a miniature almost, isn't it? Yes. We also do cover fan sticks. I have one that Miss Bryce sent. That is, in, you can see it is worn out and with ivory fan sticks, of course, Ooh. we do want to reuse them. And that's a nice way to use small bits of silk that we have left over. The summer's upon us as well. Do you carry parasols? Parasols? Umbrellas? Umbrellas? That is what this is. Oh. This one is not oiled. This is just silk. So this would not be used in the rain. You would have oil cloth for a uh, umbrella to resist the water. So that's certainly for our warm weather season coming up. Indeed. Right now. Okay. You have a lovely selection of hats as well. Yes. Could you tell us about those? We have a plated straw hat. This is very simple. It has silk binding and silk trim. Beautiful. And then the others began as plated straw and they've been covered with silk and decorated. You can see two colors of silk with ribbon. Now these are certainly more costly than many because there are yards and yards of ribbon. This one particularly has lace and we just have a little bit of lace left. We cannot import more lace. And this one was ordered by a customer. So once our lace goes, we will not have any more lace, sadly. We do have a little bit of lace on some handkerchiefs and on a cap to use up, but we are waiting for order. There's a little bit of lace on our morning hood. And I believe you have a mask, do you not? Yes, we do. It is called a Moretta mask for masquerade. It is silk velvet lined with linen and cardboard in the middle. And you hold the bead in your mouth. Oh, my. Mr. Bryce ordered five of these for, for a masquerade ball. Did women wear makeup or is it uh, considered bad for them? Women did wear makeup. The ladies of quality wore face powder. They had white face paint or cream that they would rub in. They wore rouge, liquid rouge, which was made with roses and other scented things. Um, burnt clothes to paint their eyebrows on. We have one other question from a Betsy Jordan. Can you show us your linen mitts and tell us what types of women would wear them? Upper class, working class, middling sort? Well, these linen mitts would be a more middling and, uh, sort and perhaps an upper class lady just during the day. They're a little fancier. They have the embroidery on the sides and all around the edges. But these are wonderful for keeping the sun off of your arms and it adds to keeping you cool. They're very lightweight. I have seen women that are a lower sort wear very plain linen mitts with no embroidery on them. Very nice. And Carolyn Murphy would like to know about the green hat with the bow. This is a bonnet. It's a lovely bonnet. And it is also silk. Now, did you make this or did you have the, was this imported? No, we made these. We order plain hats and hat forms and decorate them here. Milliners do a lot of hats. You can buy them, but we find that we prefer to uh, have our customers choose how they want their hats covered. Sometimes they will bring cloth to us to have a hat match a gown, and then we will use their cloth to cover. That's wonderful, thank you. So the women of Annapolis absolutely added to the commerce of the city? Indeed, indeed. We are just like any other merchant. We might be a smaller shop, but we import goods. 
when we are able to and we sell them and we have our regular customers that come in and support us with their purchases. And in this shop, as I mentioned outside, it is all women. You have two milliners, you have an apprentice and you have a servant. So our servant has left. I released her for the day. I was staying late to finish Mrs. Bryce's order, but she takes care of the fire in the winter and getting us food and keeping us so we can work and she takes care of the house. And did you learn your art from your mother? I did not. I was an apprentice in Williamsburg. Very nice. And you came here to Naples. I see that you've already gotten some of uh, Mistress White's uh, pastries over here. Indeed. I was so happy to have those since I was staying late. I have not had supper. Well, we are so very thankful for you having us in tonight. And thank you for coming. And I hope you will come and patronize us. And I hope our shop will be full of new goods when this economy gets back open. We absolutely do. Thank you. And this You're is our very first welcome. shift to shop. And we leave you at your shop. Good work. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure to get to hear your questions coming in. Um, this is We're going to have a last time here for questions. If anyone else has anything to ask before we say goodbye. Uh, the only other question that we haven't missed is was the hair powder and the pomatum accessible to all or just reserved for the well-to-do and the wealthy? Anybody can make them. There are books of instructions on how to make your own. So I would imagine if you chose to make your own, you might save a few pennies. Thank you very much. Again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please make sure to follow us on whatever social media platform is your preferred one so that you can see all of the wonderful things that will be coming up at the Bag House and other historic Annapolis properties this summer as we begin slowly reopening. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Stay safe.